So throughout the day, I use my phone a lot. <laughs> I wake up. I wake up, I probably check it before I take a shower. Try and separate from it, but it's hard. So I have two cell phones, a personal cell phone and a work cell phone. In the situation where I lose my phone, I actually could be quite stressed out and panicked. Whenever I like don't know what to do, my first instinct is to pull out my phone. No, I wouldn't say I'm addicted to my phone. I think I just use it a little too much. It would be kind of challenging to go for a long amount of time without my phone. I'd say it's not too much time. I'd say it's just balanced. I do sometimes wake up because of notifications. I try not to sleep with my phone like on the pillow next to me. I use my phone as an alarm. Three or four times a week, it will be an inconvenience that I'm woken up and I can't go back to sleep. It happened this morning. Phone usage and screen time usage is a big problem and it does cause a lot of fights. Phone use doesn't really cause arguments. They're never big arguments. They're mainly just little like scuffles. You know, my wife will catch me and, you know, give me that really look on her face. I'd say more of the battles are with him getting off the phone. I'd, I'd like to be better at that. It's been a concern because the phone use or device use by my son is what everybody else is doing now. It's kind of the norm for them. We have to set boundaries. If, if he could, he would play it all day long and it's not healthy. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody is enjoying their snack and is feeling re-energized for the rest of the morning. My name is Michael Robb. I am the Senior Director of Research at Common Sense, and I am very pleased today to talk to you about our new report, which you probably got when you came in today, which I think covers very relatable ground, especially if you're a parent, and also even if you're not. Um, we first did this study back in 2016 amidst concerns that mobile devices were monopolizing our attention unfairly, were addicting us and distracting us. And given how fast the pace of technology moves, we wanted to know how families are dealing with devices today and what's changed in the last three years. One major area of concern that we wanted to address was the relationship between mobile device and sleep. And why? Poor sleep has re repeatedly been linked to a number of negative outcomes including things like health problems like obesity, uh, poor academic performance, uh, impaired cognitive functioning. So the extent to which mobile devices are displacing or disrupting sleep is very important to study. <clears throat> Our phones and tablets affect sleep in a couple of ways, by stimulating us right before bed so that uh, it's difficult to fall asleep or stay asleep, by pushing back our bedtimes because we're just finishing up a show or a conversation, or through the effects of bright lights, you know, of holding up that bright, especially blue light, right close to your face right before bedtime. And I think it's in our collective interest to uh, ensure that teens and parents are getting enough sleep and that their sleep is not being unnecessarily disturbed by their technology. So this survey is the second wave of a study uh, that we did in 2016, tracking how mobile devices are affecting families, specifically looking at how parents and teens feel about the time that they spend on their mobile devices, how device use affects the relationships, and how it distracts and causes conflict. And the survey is also unique in that it gets at how parents and teens see each other's mobile device use. And to get this data, we surveyed 1,000 parents and teens across the country, that is 500 parents and 500 teens from within the same household. So what did we find? Nearly three quarters of parents, 74%, had their mobile device within their grasp, that is either in their bed with them or within reach when they went to sleep, right? And that includes 12% of parents who say they are taking it physically into bed with them. Similarly, nearly seven in 10 teens kept their mobile devices either in bed or within reach, though teens seem to have a more intense relationship with their phones at night, as evidenced by the fact that they were much more likely than their parents to sleep with their mobile devices. During the night, many teens and parents are having their sleep interrupted. One in three teens wakes up and checks their mobile device for something other than the time, at least once a night, so think about that. If you were to 
you know, for a lot of teachers here, if you were to look out of your classroom and assume that at least one in three of those kids were awake in the night doing things on their phone, like, that would be a big deal, especially know what we know about the relationship between sleep and lots of other outcomes. And one in four parents is doing this as well. And why? Why are they doing this? Well, about half of parents say that they are waking up and checking either because they received a notification um, or because they couldn't sleep. For teens, the top two reasons that uh, they give for waking up and checking are because either they received a notification, more than half say that that's why they're doing it, and more than half also say because they want to check social media. Furthermore, the American Academy of Pediatrics, among others, recommends that kids don't sleep with devices in their bedrooms, including smartphones, obviously. And they also recommend avoiding exposure to screens for one hour before bedtime. And I bet if I was to take a casual survey of this room and see how many of you have no screen use in the hour before bed, it would be a very, very, very low number. Um, and that is certainly the case here, where you can see that 61% um, and 70% of parents and teens are using mobile devices uh, within 30 minutes of bed. And then within five minutes, 26% of parents and 40% of teens. And if you include within like the full hour, it's like 90% or even a little bit more. So it's clear that many families are experiencing compromised sleep. Many of our habits are, are not good ones. Um, but what else is going on in family lives? How else do we perceive our relationships to our devices? Well, the number of parents who say that they spend too much time on their mobile devices has increased by 23 points in three years, which I tell you, as somebody who does a lot of research, you don't see gains or drops like that very often. So it was quite startling to me. So in other words, more than half of parents say that they feel like they are spending too much time on their mobile devices. But the opposite is true for teens. 39% of teens say they spend too much time on their devices compared to 61% back in 2016. And I, I find those trend lines quite striking. Additionally, more kids wish their parents would get off their device. There's been an 11-point increase in the number of children who think that their parents spend too much time on their device from 28% up to 39% today. Um, and there's also been a 22-point decrease in the number of kids who think that their parents spend the right amount of time on their mobile device. And you can see that for parents, things haven't changed much, um, which is probably because a lot of them already felt this way in 2016, so there wasn't as much room for growth. More teens think that their parents are addicted to their mobile devices. So 38% of teens feel their parent is addicted to their mo mobile device, and that's a 10-point, 11-point um, increase since 2016. And the number of parents who think that their kid is addicted to their mobile device has remained fairly consistent from 2016 to 2019. And again, it started high, it stayed high. There may not have been as much room for growth there. Lots of people are feeling distracted and feel like the other is distracted as well. So 54% of parents and 58% of kids said that they are distracted by their mobile device once a day or more. And while over two-thirds of parents, so 69%, say that their child is distracted by their device at least once a day, only 44% of teens say the same about their parents. Here's another interesting one. Conflicts over mobile device are less common than they were three years ago. Parents say that they argue with their teens over mobile devices less often today. So 54% say, excuse me, so 23% um, of parents today say that they argue about their device at least once a day and 20% of teens. Um, this is a really interesting one and I'm gonna get to what I think is happening in, in just a bit. But despite this, parents are more likely to say that today that their child's use of mobile devices has hurt their relationship, so 28% versus 15% in 2016. And that is striking to me, even though majorities of parents and teens say that the use of mobile devices has not had an impact on the relationship with each other. Now, children certainly see an impact on the relationship when they believe that their parent is addicted to their device. So children who believe that their parent is addicted to their device are 18 points more likely to say that their parent's behavior has hurt their relationship. So 20% of kids who think their parent is addicted versus 2% who don't. And similarly, if you are a parent and you think that your child is addicted to their device, you are 31 points more likely to believe that that behavior has hurt your relationship. So 40% of parents who think that their kid is addicted um, versus 9% who do not. So what are some takeaways from, from this data? 
Number one, when it comes to sleep, I think it's alarming to see so many teens sleeping with mobile devices in their beds and acknowledging that they are woken up at night by their devices. Good sleep hygiene would dictate that the mobile device stay out of the room if possible, or at a minimum, put on silence, do not disturb, or some kind of similar mode. And if teens and parents are suffering the ill effects of mobile device use, sleep disruption may be one of the main reasons why. It was interesting to note elsewhere in the report the number of parents and teens who say that they are using their mobile devices for work or school purposes right before bed, which I think brings up an interesting point, which is that pointing to mobile devices as problematic in and of them themselves um, may be also sidestepping an underlying challenge, which is that teens say they need their mobile devices to complete schoolwork, and lots of parents say that they feel obliged to be doing late night work as well. Uh, number two, it was really interesting to note that on the parent side, that there are many um, parents, which have grown significantly since 2016, who worry that they spend too much time on their mobile devices. And as parents have gotten concern, more concerned, teens are going the other direction. They're less likely to say that they spend too much time on their devices. Fewer say that they feel addicted to their uh, devices compared to three years ago. Why are these moving in opposite directions? I think there could be a few things happening. So for parents, it could be that in the last few years, there's been a lot of negative attention put on the relationship uh, between phones and our, um, and our own well-being, and particularly the effects of uh, smartphones on our well-being. And so maybe that's really resonating with parents, and that's really sinking in. Or it could be that they're just generally experiencing more or feeling more negative repercussions of their own mobile device use. For the kids, maybe we're seeing some kind of no mobile device normalization. So many of whom have been surrounded by technology uh, since birth, even relative to the group of teens that we surveyed back in 2016. And at the same time, kids may not be seeing the negative effects or don't have a comparison to a time without mobile devices. So you know, they're reacting in ways that are counter to how we perceive that they are supposed to feel. Or perhaps, because they are teens, and teens often like to be contrary, they see their parents freaking out about phones and essentially are going the other way to say, mom, really, no, I'm fine. I'm not sure. I think some additional research is going to be useful to find out more about some of the whys here. And I'll look forward to seeing what those trend lines look like the next time that we do this survey. Last point. More parents than in 2016 feel that their teens are distracted by their devices daily. And for teens, the feeling is mutual. Yet they are arguing less about it than they were three years ago. What is going on? Is this a reflection that people have just resigned themselves to being distracted? Perhaps what we are seeing is the emergence of some kind of tech apathy within the home, or a realization that mobile devices have changed the nature of our daily lives so much that maybe it's just not worth fighting about. It's also interesting to note that perceptions of whether a parent or teen is addicted or feels addicted colors how each feels about whether device use has hurt their relationship. Children clearly see a negative impact on the quality of their relationship when they believe that their parent is addicted, and parents feel the same. And these families are the ones that probably need the most support and the most guidance and discussion to help navigate more balanced use of technology in their day-to-day -day lives. So as we await future research, we should acknowledge that there are not easy answers for families that are wrestling with how to best integrate mobile devices into their lives. Many of us in this room are still grappling with trying to find the, the right amount and the right kind of use and not let it distract us or cause arguments. And of course, it's certainly going to be difficult for parents to enforce rules that they themselves are not following. So finding a balanced approach to mobile device use is going to take effort, it's going to take thought, it's going to take practice, it's going to need buy-in and help from industry, from educators, from policymakers. And it's our hope that families come closer to achieving that balance, even as tech becomes ever more um, intertwined in our lives. And so now that you've heard some about the research, I will open it up to questions, if there are any. Hi, I have a uh, uh, high school uh, freshman and a college freshman who've grown up with mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And the sense I'm getting both from my own life and from your data is that teens see right through us and we're massive hypocrites. <laughs> uh, is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> Do, does your data point to that? I mean, I don't use the word hypocrite in this report. <laughs> um, but we do say at Common Sense and elsewhere, modeling is incredibly important. So if you have rules in your home, like you don't want your kids to be using devices at the dinner table, 
or at bedtime, it's going to be very, very difficult to enforce those rules um, if you yourself are not following them. And I think that you are seeing a lot of that, right? So like the kinds of behaviors that kids are showing tend to be more the kinds of behaviors that parents are showing. And you see that also not just in the behaviors, but also in their feelings. So we see entire households where everybody feels addicted to their device, where they feel distracted, or they feel spent too much time. Those two things are, are well correlated. So I, yes, I mean, I think those two things go hand in hand quite a bit of the time. I was just wondering if you looked at gender and analyzing this data. Um, we did do a little bit of work looking at some of the gender stuff. Um, you know, I made a note here on it's one, of the, one of the more interesting ones. Give me just one second. So one of the things that we found in this data was specifically regarding the sleep data is that um, girls tend to be more likely to bring their, bring their phones into bed with them to sleep and to wake up uh, to check their devices. So, and if actually, if you look in the back of the report, there's some other gender differences that, um, that you can explore. One more uh, question? One more question. Yep. The perfect question. Um, right. Yes. So, I'm curious if there is um, older data that this compares to around people's previous social practices. Like, is there data about, like, people who used to go out more often or who used to, you know, spend time drinking with coworkers and how their families describe them compared to how mobile use is being described now? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, we don't obviously have that from this particular data, but um, and you've seen in some popular books and literature that concept that um, uh, the things that we're doing are more isolating, this kind of bowling alone concept, that we're doing these kind of more independent things that disconnect us from the community. And I'm not sure exactly how well it ties into how we spend our individual time, but certainly it is the case that we have some data that um, even pre-smartphones, the use of screens, for example, in, in the bedroom has always been a, a, an issue. So like if you, if you have a television set in your bedroom, that is well related to getting less sleep, right? And that's, for, that's true for kids and, and for parents. Um, but it, it certainly would be something very worthwhile to explore, but it's, it's not something we can tell from this data. And with that, um, thank you very much.